excited uh, to introduce uh, John Elder. And I wish I had a copy of his book, uh, which I've, I've read, um, to show you. Uh, it's, a, it's a classic in the field. I was lucky enough, actually, to receive a free copy of this book when I took a, uh, a workshop with John a couple years ago as part of the Predictive Analytics World uh, Conference, which is actually going on right now. We're starting tomorrow um, in the city in town uh, for that, that event, which is where you know, lots of these vendors get together and, and, and talk to uh, people about um, what to use. And then they just insert into the different vendors some folks who uh, can talk more academically about what's going on. Uh, so John is a uh, recovering academic uh, <laughs> who has a firm called uh, Elder Research based in my old town, my old stomping grounds of Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. And uh, he's got a whole bunch of wonderful talks, some of which I think you can access online, uh, including what the 10 errors of uh, yeah, data science. The, the great ways to shoot yourself in the foot with data science. Yeah, yeah it's that, a top ten data mining mistake. So. That's, that's a classic. <laughs> um, is that available for, for public consumption? Um, on, on it's written up at, as chapter twenty in that in that book. Um, I'm not sure it's available as a video, but. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I, I won't delay any further. Uh, welcome, welcome, John. All right. Thanks. And this is a little loud, so you can bring it down a little bit. But um, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. I got a little extra tour of Berkeley. Sorry, I'm all late. You were filling time wonderfully well. Um, it turns out Uber has got bugs in it. So uh, uh, both the start and finish, it had the dots in the wrong places. So it was a fun, it was a fun, ex exciting experiment. But um, it's been a while since I've been here, and uh, and it's delightful to be here. I'm glad to glad to be here, and. Uh, Data science is really exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm really, you guys are uh, doing a great thing to study it and, and getting some get some great instruction, a lot of a lot of good wisdom, good use of your time. And what I'm going to do, I hope, doesn't discourage you, uh, because I've been doing data science for decades. I had Elder Research as a firm, uh, elderresearch.com. If you look us up, um, if you want to email me, Elder at Elder Research. So it should, I like my name, so it just kind of shows up over and over. Um, but, um, and we've done a lot of exciting things with it. But what I'm going to focus on today is where it can break down. Um, so what a wonderful way to get started, right? That's, here's how, but if you, if you know where it can break down, you're really armed to do it right. And if you know how to truly evaluate the true effectiveness of a model, then that's a really powerful thing. So the, the most important thing is how well is this model going to do on new data it hasn't seen. Data like the data you trained it on, but not exactly. So the paradigm is you're, you're doing inductive modeling. Deductive modeling is you start with a theory and you apply it to specific cases. Inductive modeling, you start with specific cases and you learn the theory from that that then you can apply to new cases that are similar but not identical. So it's like learning algebra where all you have are the questions and the answers, but you only have the answers to the odd numbered questions and not the even number of questions. You don't have any instruction. You just have questions and answers to some of the problems. And from that, you try to learn the laws of algebra and then apply them to the even number problems that you don't have the answers to yet. And that's really the analogy. Only it's even worse than that because your copy is faded and old and there are errors. The questions have errors in them and the answers have errors in them. And yet you still want to learn as much of the laws of algebra as you can from that noisy, partial, incomplete, erroneous data. And that's a, that's a good analogy for our real world problems that we're facing. And the good news is it's, it's possible to do that. But it depends on the degrees of the error and the amount of coverage and how similar the new questions are to the old questions and things like that. And really all of science is that. All of science is trying to figure out from clues what's going on. And a lot of it comes down to making observations and building up hypotheses to explain those observations and, and comparing competing hypotheses. And there's a statistical series of tests that says, how likely is what I observed, could it have happened by chance? 
because that's always the default hypothesis that this just happened by chance versus it happened because of some causal relationship be that I'm trying to prove could have been the cause. It never, you can't prove it, but you can say how likely could it, how likely is it that it could have happened. So we'll talk today about a way to correct for that because what people are doing is they're using ancient statistical formula that were devised 100 years ago by geniuses, but they weren't really well anticipating today's repeated experiments, our ability to try 100 different things. The formulas were really built for trying one thing at a time. And we need to correct for that. The consequence is really horrible. The consequence is that, uh, well, I'll explain that in a minute, that most of the findings, especially in medical journals, are false. But many other times when you're trying to observe things from data, they're false. But that can be corrected. Half, most, most of the problems with that can be corrected for with something you might be able to pick up from what I'm telling you today. And I say you might be able to because it's a little bit subtle, but it's also mostly common sense. It's not calculus. It's an idea that you could pick up in the next hour and a quarter or so. What is my deadline? <laughs> so. Okay, so next hour, hour and a quarter, uh, it's possible that you'll be in the top 1% of all data scientists in understanding an important concept. Or at least you'll understand the need for somebody to understand it, which will be way ahead of the pack. So that seems like a, a, an awfully bold thing, but if you, if you understand that issue, you, um, you could possibly head off disaster at your firm. So to arm you with the, the, what the power, the potential, and the pitfalls are, just mention that you know, data science is extremely powerful, predictive analytics, inductive modeling, machine learning, there's all very, very related terms. Even artificial intelligence is on the, on the border of these things. And we've used them for improving credit scoring, beating companies that do credit scoring for a living, beating them at their own game, at uh, identifying individuals from the reflectivity of their skin, from uh, infrared light being shined on their skin, a new way to you know, do the equivalent of fingerprints. Um, we've used it for uh, simple things like upsell and cross-sell like Amazon does, or for more sophisticated things like fraud detection or insider threat detection, who inside a federal agency is possibly giving away secrets to foreign governments or something like that. Um, so for, for small things and large, uh, I now want to talk to Uber about improving their, <laughs> their algorithm, but uh, for small things and large, uh, wherever you have past examples, even if there's some rare cases like fraud or, or treason, you can learn from those to try to filter and find the needles in the haystack for future cases and prioritize that precious resource of the analyst's time and energy. Uh, we, we recently helped an oil company um, prioritize where, which, and predict which natural gas wells were going to freeze up and, and clog months, half a year ahead of time so they could send crews to uh, do remedial action before it was going to occur. Sort of a, uh, what is that movie where the, the cops show up before the crime is committed, you know, uh, for natural gas. Yeah. It's a Tom Cruise movie, I think. Um, Minority Report, thank you. Um, so, uh, Minority Report for, for gas wells. But anyway, uh, so, um, and that's, that could, could save them. They haven't yet implemented it, but it could save them $100 million if they did. It's kind of confusing why they're not implementing. I guess that's pocket change for oil companies. But anyway, uh, so that's on, that's on the positive side. And a lot of this is... Uh, it seems very new because it's gotten a lot of attention recently, but it really isn't that new. Uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of hype as well as substance going back a long way. So here's the cover of Time magazine from March of 1996. So that's a generation ago. And this was, on the, this was when Gary Kasparov was playing Deep Blue in chess. 
you know, Gary Kasparov won the first round. Deep Blue beefed up, the, IBM beefed up their, uh, their hardware and their algorithms, and they used data mining to figure out how to do the trade-off between positions to score the positions better, and actually beat Kasparov, who's probably the world's greatest chess player of all time, um, in the second round. And then Kasparov figured out some things about the way the AI algorithms were working and uh, challenged them to a third round, but IBM said, nope, we won, dismantled the machine, you know, marketing achievement achieved, you know, so, uh, and, and this, but at, at the, as the first round was going on, Time Magazine came out with, can machines think? They already do say scientists, that homogenous band. So what, if anything, is special about the human mind? And they interviewed a lot of scientists, although, frankly, as an engineer, they really just interviewed computer scientists, which doesn't count as scientists. But anyway, the silliest thing I've ever seen in print was from an MIT professor of computer science who said, of course machines can think. After all, humans are just machines made of meat. And I thought, how can anyone who's worked with humans and worked with computers, oh, he's from MIT. He's never worked with humans. So that explains it. So he could think they were pretty similar. So in my opinion, they're very different. And we have weaknesses, and the computer has weaknesses, and uh, it's very, very important to figure out what those are and to work together. A great book on human weaknesses, by the way, is uh, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. He's a Nobel laureate in economics, although he's really a psychologist, but he's a fantastic individual and a fantastic researcher, and that book is just chock full of a lot of wisdom about our cognitive biases, about how we as humans think not in very predictable, biased ways about things. So that's beautiful about our errors. But then about computer errors, there's a lot of ways in which the computer uh, makes mistakes. So it's extremely important to work together. Um, but, but doing all these powerful things that we can do with computers and working together, um, th th there have been relatively phenomenal breakthroughs recently uh, in the game space. The Go game has been played. You, you, the, the progress with uh, self-driving cars has been a lot faster than people would have predicted a few years ago. And, uh, and of course, in more business arenas, the, the very quick adoption, uh, having been doing this for a couple of decades, has been a little bit uh, uh, surprising to see how quickly all of a sudden things have sort of a, a break point has occurred where it's been much more adopted recently. It's been, it was so hard to push. Part of the difficulty with doing anything, and you'll run into this if you're trying to bring change to an organization, is uh, I'm a very technical person and so it seems very obvious. Well, here's what the information tells us we ought to do. Let's change to doing it this way. But there's a really dangerous word in there, and that was the word change. And that's, a, and that's the most dangerous barrier. The technical problem is much less challenging than the change management problem, the soft problem of getting carbon-based life forms to do something different than they did the day before, the year before, or the decade before. So when we, the first decade of running elder research, we solved 90% of the problems handed to us, 93% of the problems handed to us. And uh, some of them were really, really hard. Some had never been solved before. Uh, but only two-thirds of those solutions got implemented. And the, third, and the reason was, when we looked into it and dug into it, was it was the change management part, the, the politics, uh, the, 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 the danger, the, the, the risk, the fear, or the perceived risk of doing something in a new way. So we've done a lot more early on to help develop that trust in the people involved, trust in the technologies involved, st stepping, walking before running, that sort of thing, to, um, to reduce that risk, because that risk is much greater than technology risk. And I could talk more about that, but let's, let's focus on the most important thing. Well, here's the thing that kicked it off for me, you know, the topic of today. This is an article from The Economist from October 2013, so a few years ago now how science goes wrong. And, and the article's still available on the web. A couple, there's actually a couple articles in this issue. One that's a summary article that's just as long as the article itself, but it has lots of great examples in it of 
how surprisingly bad scientific research is at being replicated, which means it's not science. If, some, you can't, if you do an experiment and you write, here's how to do this experiment, mix these chemicals together, you know, bake for this long, and it's like a recipe, right? There's like an algorithm that says, follow these steps, you should get this result. And it's kind of like those nailed it th video or, or pictures on the web, you know, where somebody's trying to create a, a little Shrek cake or something, and they picture, and you, you know, they nailed it. You know, it's pretty funny if you go look at those things. Well, unfortunately, that's what a lot of science is like. Somebody says, here's how you do it, and somebody else follows it, and it gets something completely different, and it doesn't replicate the results. It doesn't, it doesn't get the right result, and it doesn't do it so much that you wonder if that person who published it wasn't just a fluke. It wasn't just a cherry-picked result. And in fact, that's exactly what it was most of the time. That's what's scary, is most of the time. Let me show you some of the examples. Well, actually, let me show you what it's supposed to be like before we go to some of the examples, because we don't want to be like those folks that criticize things before we know what's really going on. You know, I hate to be one of those folks that has all these ways to, you know, improve the process before they know what's, we have words for that, right? Millennial. But anyway, no, sorry. Uh, so the, the peer review process, you, you study something, and then you write about your results, and, and you try to make it interesting. You hope that it's something interesting. You submit it to a journal. Has anybody here ever written a journal article? Or, okay, Lo lovely process, right? How many years did it take to? She, Fariba, apparently has written. What journal was it? Kind of like pending on this reviews. Yes. So the stakes are very high. Yeah. It could take years because it's going through reviewers. Reviewers are not paid anything for the reviews. And so this process of, of the editor, the associate editor, is nagging the reviewers to get comments back. And they are puzzling about what the heck the paper is all about. You know, uh, some of them are doing a really diligent job and making very good reviews. Others, others are not. You know, it's, a, it's from the goodness of their hearts and for the benefit of mankind that they're doing this. So it's not on their top 10 list because there are other things that are putting food on the table, right? But, but they do it because someday they hope to also have their papers fairly reviewed. And so it's extremely indirect. Whenever you don't have good economic incentives, it's a bad system. And this is a bad system. They need to have good economic incentives, uh, good incentives that are tied to, um, in any case, uh, out of the goodness of their hearts, they, they do this phenomenal job of reviewing and providing very great uh, suggestions, which this person diligently responds to. And it, it shows up, and eventually, through this meat grinder, something gets published. right? And one of the things involved in here is a magical formula that says your results were significant. They passed some kind of thing, and we'll talk a lot about that. So that's the ideal process. But what's happening is pretty scary. Uh, the British Medical Journal, one of the top high-impact journals, uh, looked, was worried about how things were being reviewed. They put in a paper and gave it to all of their reviewers. And they gave them extra work to do, all 1,500 reviewers. And they had serious fatal errors in the paper. And 92% of the referees missed the fatal errors. So they were doing a calibration check on everybody. The Lancet, another British medical journal, they accept only 1 20th of the papers that go through that are submitted to them, which are already self-selected. You don't just send to the Lancet if you're anybody, right? And only one out of 20 papers go. So they must be really good papers, right? Well, even the Lancet has admitted they think that half of the papers have bogus results that they publish. They just don't know which half. Half, by the way, that's a low estimate. That's their estimate. So that's, a, that's, the, that's the floor. That's the best case scenario. OK? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to drive home the point how bad the situation is. Now, Amgen, a big drug company, tried to replicate 58 very important studies on which a lot of things depend, could only replicate about 10% of them. Bayer Healthcare, the same thing, could replicate about a quarter of the studies that they were tried, that they spent millions on. Yes? Is this the case of their studies or other studies which has been published, they try to replicate what they 58 of the major studies that they either 
their drugs either depend on or they were hoping to do build drugs on. They spent millions to do clinical trials to replicate. So there, there's basically, that brings up a good point, there's basically two kinds of publications or two kinds of studies. The gold standard is when you do a clinical trial and you say beforehand, I'm going to try this compound, this drug out, and I'm going to break the population into two pieces. Uh, I'm going to give the drug to one half and I'm going to give a placebo to the other half. And I'm going to try to break these two populations as evenly as possible in terms of age and sex and pre-existing conditions and so forth. And I'm not going to tell them where, who's getting the drug and who's not. In fact, I'm not going to tell the doctors. That's called a double-blind study. The patient is blind to whether they're getting it, the doctor is blind to it because the doctor might subtly, you know, treat you casually if I'm just giving you this sugar pill. Hour. And, and it's even uh, more interesting than that because, uh, well, neither of them know. So as far as everyone knows, you're getting the, the thing. But now with social media, let's say you, this half is not getting the drug. You're on social media, you've been going to the doctor every month for six months now, and you needed to go for six more months, but the drug's not been seemingly doing anything for you. So you get on social media and you look around for other people and they're in the study, and some are complaining of side effects, and you haven't had any side effects, so you quit the study. I'm not getting the placebo, this is a waste of my time. So what do they do now? They put side effects in the placebo, intentionally. So you're not only not getting a drug, you're getting something that's bad for you, but it has even more powerful a placebo effect. If you were testing a placebo versus nothing, the placebo would be significant for everything. The placebo would show that it's good for hair loss, weight loss, liver cancer, cures, I mean, the, the placebo effect is so powerful that it, that giving a person a placebo, even if you tell them it's a placebo, is more powerful than doing nothing. It's amazing. Something's going on. It even causes chemical changes in the body, in some cases. So, um, something weird's going on. Anyway, so to beat a placebo is a really hard thing to do, and some drugs just barely beat it. Some things that used to, that passed in the past, 10 years ago, wouldn't pass today because placebos today are more powerful because they have the side effects. So, anyway. <laughs> so, a, a, a controlled study where the population has been split in half and you do everything identical with them except that the drug is in one pill and not in the other pill is the best way to tell if this drug's good or not. That's, the, that's, that's the, the highest quality test. Now, you can't do that with a lot of things, and you can't do that with things like smoking or with death of a parent or, you know, we're going to break these groups in half. And, you know, you're not going to do a study like that. You can do that with animals, but you can't do that with people. Um, now, and if you're in Berkeley, you can't do that with animals anyway. But anyway, so, no, if you, uh, if you, but you can do observational studies. You can take data that you find in the wild and you can try to see if there's any correlations in that data that can let you tease out relationships even though it's not under a controlled experiment where all the variables are as accounted for as possible except for that one difference that you're trying to test. Okay? So there are, there are these databases like the nurses nurses study that's gone a longitudinal study for a long time where nurses are professionals and they're, they believe in research and they're easy to find and so forth. So they've been recording what they eat and their diseases for a long time and, and so they have this data over a long period of time and other data like that where they've been tracking people for a long time. And so then from that data, people can sift through it and look, oh, broccoli is good for you because people who eat broccoli have less liver cancer and so forth. But there's more likelihood that there's a spurious correlation in that data. So how can you tell if, it, if the finding is real or not? And that's what we kind of want to get at. So some of these studies were on observational or found data, but then there was a designed experiment where some people eat broccoli, some people don't, you know, and then 
they didn't replicate. I'm using the broccoli as an example. I don't know if that was one of them. So, um, and then that was exactly what a friend of mine, Stan Young, who worked, used to work at a drug company did, is he took 12 of those kind of uh, headline-making um, observational findings, things that had been found from observational data, and did designed experiments where you break populations into two and actually do it. And not only were none of the findings replicated, seven were neutral and five were reversed. So if you read that wine is good for you, and then, then a few months later you read the red wine's bad for you, and chocolate's good for you, or, you know, it'll appear on the front page of the paper, but the, re, the, the 19 studies that showed no change won't get published. That's another problem, is that uninteresting findings don't get published, the so-called file drawer effect. But also the negative findings aren't as interesting as the positive findings. And so there's, there's a lot of, there's political issues as well as scientific issues. We'll just talk mostly about the scientific issues today. Um, and here's, I don't know if you're familiar with the cartoon XKCD, but the fellow's pretty brilliant and he describes very well one of the problems, which is the repeated experiment problem or the repeated idea problem, or what I call the vast search problem. So somebody comes in and says, jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate. They're a little unwilling because they're playing Minecraft, but eventually they do. And they come back and say, no, no, it's, it's, under, it's not within the significance threshold, which we'll talk about later. But nobody stops with that, right? Your first idea doesn't work. You don't stop there. No, you persistence. You know, you're creative. You keep going forward. Maybe it's the color. So one after another, they try all the different colors, purple, yellow, green, teal, you know, brown. And all those panels are the same except one, if you can find it. There. So the next day, green jelly beans linked to acne, 95% confidence, only 5% chance of coincidence. So this is like rolling. A, so the 5% chance of coincidence, there's a statistical test that says, I tried this thing. And the chance of the result that I got was like rolling a 20-sided die and getting a 20. You know, it's numbered from 1 to 20. And I rolled it one time, and I got the 20. So that was the chance of reaching into this data and getting this result. I reached into this urn, and I pulled out the one red ball out of the 20 balls that were in there. And that statistical test is valid. And if it was the one test they did, then this may be a valid headline. But it wasn't the one test they did. They tried all, they reached into there 20 times. Now if you reach into, say there's an urn, and you reach in there 20 times, and there's a 1 in 20 chance of getting it, are you certain to get the, the one red ball in there? Like you reach in, you pull it out, and you replace it, and then you reach in blindly and pull it out the one and replace it. If you reach in 20 times, are you certain to eventually get the red ball? No, not quite. You could miss it. But your chances go up to like 80% or something like that. You know, it's a very, very high chance. So there's not a 5% chance of coincidence. It's extremely likely that you're going to find the best result. So the repeated, the repeated trying of different ideas, the best, the cherry picked, you roll the 20 sided dice 20 times, the chance of getting a high number is very great. And it's not. The, the same chance of just rolling it once. And that's a trivial idea. But if you keep that in mind, that's the core idea behind the whole thing. And so anytime someone comes up with a result and has a significance test result, you have to ask them, how many times did you try? How many things did you try? Did you take that into account? And so what um, I'll talk about today is a way to actually do that automatically. Um, and in that way, you'll avoid these spurious correlations because the great danger in data science is that you will find something that you think is true that is false, which is much worse than not finding anything at all because you'll act on it. You'll, you'll get your whole recommendation engine going. There's a company that built a recommendation engine. You know, Amazon thinks they double their sales per, per user or per session because of the recommendation engine. No, people that bought this also like this or people who looked at this or clicked on that like this people with your profile like this. And, uh, and that's very helpful with this vast array of possible products out there, right? 
Um, there was a company that, and a lot of times, when companies used to have to, we built recommendation engines for firms before, and there was a company that went out of business not to, but a couple weeks after they had built a recommendation engine and put it into effect. And in the figuring out what happened afterwards, uh, it turned out the recommendation engine was fine. They just uh, turned it, they had the sign wrong. They were showing people the products they would be least interested in. Giving them. So they, you know, you can have data science and you can just use it wrong. So it could be very powerful, you can very powerfully put you right out of business if you, if you don't have common sense to sort of check the results. So here is a true correlation over a 10 year period, um, 11 year period. The number of films that Nicolas Cage appears in is in black. And the number of people who drown by falling into a pool is in red. And so there's a scary, scary correlation. We obviously want to keep Nicolas Cage off of the silver screen. It's, a, it's dangerous to people. Uh, here's another one. Um, as worldwide non-commercial space launches increase, sociology doctorates are, are clearly also going to increase uh, because they're very tightly coupled, apparently. So anyway, if you look at enough things over a short enough period of time, so there's only, in this case, um, about 13 data points. And if you look at hundreds of variables, it's only constrained by 13 data points, you can find some things that are very tightly coupled. So a paper was literally published once that talked about how the price of butter in Bangladesh was a good predictor of the S&P stock market. And the person was trying to make a joke out of it, and, and, but people still call him to this day asking about butter prices. And so it didn't work. Uh, anyway, it was a true correlation over the time period that he looked at. Um, so, we want to look out for those spurious correlations. All right, I want to pause here and kind of outline what I'm going to talk about. There's a crisis in epidemiology. That's that found data in medicine and in general in observational studies. I kind of am focusing on the medical one because it affects us all. We're really all affected by it. It affects uh, life and limb and certainly a huge investment, billions, maybe even trillions of dollars. Um, it's partly due to the vast search problem, which is made possible by today's machine learning, data mining algorithms, which can look at all sorts of variables and try to look for all sorts of correlations, some of which are going to be spurious. So how do we guard against that? Well, it's worth taking uh, some lessons from the drug industry where they use a placebo, which is a very worthy foe. They have to beat a placebo, which is extremely hard to do, very, very hard to do. And I learned a lot about placebos from our one fantastically successful uh, application, uh, our one, one problem in that area, which was fantastically successful in the drug discovery world, which I'll, I'll briefly describe. And then I'll describe the algorithm call, I call target shuffling and mention in how I use it in investment timing, oil and gas production. And then I'll show a demo, which may drive it home for baseball because uh, it's very related to um, what we'll do is we'll take the strike zone and divide it into little little regions, and that's a lot of what people do when they have sort of uh, uh, data about about customers or data about uh, either they might say you know people that of this age group in this geographic region and this income level or something like that seem to really like this product, so they'll look for who's responding to this ad or who's in this demographic or watching this TV show or something like that. They'll they'll slice and dice their customers or. That's probably not a good idea. Slice and dice abstract representations of their customers up into different little subsets and then look for hot spots in the subsets. And that's a very common thing. So we'll do that with, we'll, we'll abstract that and we'll look at actual baseball strike data and learn an important lesson there that, hope, that is easily transferable back to the business problem. By the way, real quickly, what industries or problem areas are y'all working on? That would be really helpful to me to know. It, just to pause here for a second, you know, if, you know, telecom networks. What are you What are you working on? Uh, so I work with the internal innovation management group. Uh, so I don't directly work in in the data space right now. But then some of the things that Cisco is exploring is uh, how to make the network more reliable. Uh, so how to predict issues in the network and and make it more reliable. So that's one of the applications okay. of data. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, I'm, I'm a hardware engineer at NVIDIA, uh, so I guess we build hardware that kind of speeds up like data processing. Okay. Um, yeah, so not exactly in the data field yet. Not yet, okay. For Frida? Uh, same situation, I'm in a uh, semiconductor <coughs> industry, and uh, uh, I'm uh, here as a personal interest. <coughs> so just okay. 
Thanks. Uh, we model out wealth data, so we're trying to help retailers figure out who their affluent customers are. All see right. if that's productive. Excellent. Okay. I did a bunch of different products across mm -hmm. the industries, but big data related was a cluster analysis for customer segmentation. Okay. Uh, built a text mining algorithm uh, to automatically categorize customer feedback. Um, and a prediction algorithm that would um, tailor uh, a telco offer to offer people on a way older plan uh, to swap over to the new plan. What, would, what would interest them? Would be, yeah. Interesting. Very good. Yes. I work at Visa, and one of the things related to data that we are working on is to provide the benchmarking information so that issuers can use that to improve the performance. Excellent. Thank you. Amy? Oh, yeah. So I was in uh, telecommunications, AT&T. I did a tower strategy. A lot of um, analytics, but but mostly on like financial analysis on cost optimization. All right, thank you. Uh, so my experience is in uh, energy, specifically solar. Uh, so actually, my interest is looking at uh, a ways of predicting, taking multiple variables such as like weather, energy prices, and and then predicting the output, the optimal output for uh, energy projects. Excellent, neat. I'm working in a biotech company, DNA sequencing. They have lots of informatics on how to sequence the DNA. Wow. But it's not actually me. <laughs> <laughs> Banking and uh, process analytics. Okay, okay. Con? Working in a mobile telco, and uh, we're using customer journey information data to try and figure out the impact on churn and other things. Okay, that's a fascinating area. All right, are you all back there? Oh, we're just visiting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just, and you're administering. Okay, great. Thanks. That's uh, I love. That's one thing that's so fun about this field is the variety of things that you get to work on. And sometimes you you see a connection between two fields, and that's the really, besides the solving the aha moment when you get the the really cool breakthrough, the connections are the funnest part. So. Uh, when you find something in the medical world, uh, the aerospace world that applies to the medical world, it's like, yes. Uh, so hopefully there'll be some of those uh, some of those light bulbs will go off from some things today. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the placebo. You have to believe it to see it, and especially powerful with side effects. Um, so what I have here is a is a chart that we did to show the effect of the placebo on a drug that, that we were examining for Pharmacy and Upjohn, which is now part of Pfizer. But Pharmacy and Upjohn had been separate companies that had recently merged. And they had a compound that they had invested, I think, $300 million in developing that they were considering abandoning. Because the next step, they were not sure if it was working. It wasn't passing any of their tests. And the next step would require a billion dollar investment. And this was, you know, 20 years ago when a billion dollars was a lot of money. So uh, they were doing three separate tests that would have been acceptable for it passing. So that's already cheating a little bit. How would you like to take three tests and take your best grade on any of the three tests and, and get the passing for that? You know, not, um, but it really wasn't the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, that, that they were yet, that it would require a huge further investment before it would go before the FDA. So the billion dollars was just to invest in the studies and the further work that would eventually get it and to shepherd it through the FDA process. So this was an internal decision, but they were still using tests looking forward that the FDA would approve. They didn't have to. And that was part of the issue. They didn't actually have to. Now, what I've plotted here is a very strange thing of our own, kind of our own invention. Actually, the technology was used for things like earthquakes and so forth. It's, what's, it's a density plot. I'll explain the plot, and then I'll explain what it means in terms of this problem. The red thing there, imagine it's solid. I've got it sliced so you can look through it. But the red thing there contains half the data, uh, three quarters of the data. So it's, it's, a, it's um, a shrink wrap, the smallest shrink wrap shape that would contain three quarters of the data. So it's like there are 500 invisible points swimming around inside that cube, and that shrink wrapped shape contains three quarters of them. Then the green shape inside that contains half the data, and then the two blue shapes contain the densest quarter of the data. So what you're seeing is like if it were a sphere, you would see three spheres within one another. So instead, you're seeing the shape of the data instead of this cloud of gnats, you know, a cloud of dots, like a scatter plot. It's saying, summarize that cloud of dots, because when there are too many dots 
And if you're not moving it around, you can't really see what's going on. So it's saying, show me where it's going. Show me the equivalent of a distribution, but in three dimensions rather than just one dimension, where it's going. So the, it's showing us that there's a lot of correlation between these three axes because the data is along the diagonal. All right. Now what the three axes are is the three different tests. They're correlated. The three different tests are all basic tests of how this mental drug is doing. And the way that we've plotted it is that everyone starts out at the origin in the center there, right in the middle there. And if they get completely better by test one, test two, test three, they would go to this corner. If they get completely worse, which would be life-threatening, they would be in, down in this lower level region. So the placebo hits, and over time, the person drifts from the center towards somewhere, and you can see that there's sort of, sort of two populations that have, have drifted apart. There's a, a small group that's drifted upward to the, to the good corner, and then a larger group that's drifted a little bit less far away from the center down toward the lower left corner. So you can see from this that the placebos had a mixed effect with a, a, so one population that's gotten a little bit closer to the goodness peak, maybe a slightly larger population based on the size of the blue region that's gotten a little bit worse, a little bit grumpier. Okay? So it's kind of a mixed, it's kind of a blah result although maybe net positive, um, as you'd expect from a placebo, from doing anything. Okay, that's the placebo, that's our baseline. Now, compared to that and contrasted to that, here's how the drug did. Now, can we interpret how the drug did? In our new vocabulary of this newfangled plot, anybody? Yeah, so it's, it's pushed all the way up, and in fact, in the part that we see, nobody is worse off. No, there's probably some quarter that is. Yes, the scales are the same. So everybody starts at that origin, and then um, there's some data floating around outside the red region that we don't see. A quarter of the data is floating around outside it. But this is showing where the gist of the data is. Now, is the FDA going to pay any attention to this chart? Has anybody worked in government? <laughs> no. By law, they have certain tests that they use for significance. And this is not one of them because it didn't exist prior to that. Yes, this visually shows it in a very compelling way, but it's not legally acceptable to the FDA. But do pharmacy and Upchon? Is this interesting to them? To, yes, because they're making an internal business decision. They're not constrained by the law as far as what they need to pay attention to. And they just have to make the decision, just have to make the billion dollar decision whether to go forward or not to get the evidence that then will be compelling to the FDA. And they made the decision to go forward based on this, which was not the decision they were going to make prior to seeing this. And it took 10 years for me to find out that this was a big success and this, was, this drug was one of the three drugs that they introduced in a decade. So it, was a, it had a huge impact. This slide, well, it was two slides at the time. I put it together for convenience sake. So my half billion dollar slides, um, now they paid us a few thousand dollars. No, they paid us a little bit of consulting money for it. I should have asked for a slice of the, of the uh, but nobody ever does business that way, unfortunately. Um, but the power of analytics to show things that were not seeable before, because they had very, very smart scientists working on this. I knew nothing about, I learned quickly, but it wasn't by learning about the drug discovery process and about the the biology and the chemistry, I was learning enough of that to know that I'm looking at the right variables and I'm transforming things the right way and so forth, but it's knowing about data analysis and, and how to highlight the right things and looking at things fresh. And that's what they brought us in for. And we were able to help them out in this way. So, and this is, has been possible in industry after industry to, to, when working closely with domain experts cooperatively, if you hand us some data that we don't know anything about, we're not going to be able to add much value. 
You let people do it the way they've been doing it, obviously nothing's going to, you put people together, they're cooperatively trying to solve the problem, they're able to learn from each other and go back and forth, then magic happens. And so this is a, one of my favorite examples. And um, it also shows that, you know, people who are in an industry have very specific ways they look at things. And they're in a production environment where they aren't allowed to or, or even able to because of the normal way of looking at things, think in a new way about stuff. So it helps to have some outside a look at it. So there was the book you were going to wave around. Uh, that was where I first introduced this concept I want to talk about now, which helped uh, in a number of our applications have a breakthrough. It helped us know when we had something significant, and it helped us know when we thought we had something significant that wasn't. And that's just as important, if not more important. And the key is you give people back the wrong answers. What? <laughs> so the, think, of, uh, think of us all filling out a quiz. We, we all if, do a statistics quiz. Wouldn't that be fun? And we get a score. Okay, that's the target variable, the output we're trying to predict. And then we all f answer a questionnaire about our background. You know, how old we are, and where we went to school, and how many years we've been to school, and did we have sister or not, and were we on the debate team, or did we play any sports, or whatever. And for those are our input variables that we're going to use to help predict what things lead to a good statistics score. Okay? And some of them are probably not going to matter much, the length, the number of letters in your last name. And some of them, whether we have a sister or not, might, might matter, you know, or whether our, our parents uh, were mathematicians, or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, uh, some might, might look like they matter because there's a relatively small population, but are just spurious correlations, depending on how many variables. The more variables we have in the questions, the more questions we have in our questionnaire, and the fewer people we have in the class, the more likely that something's going to line up by chance. So how do we measure that? There are mathematical ways to do that, but they all have difficulties and they're all confusing. And, um, but there's a really, really simple way to check for that that all of us can do now that we have this blindingly fast, obedient assistant, uh, the computer. Okay, And that is what I call uh, target shuffling. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the steps for it in a second, but just to explain it, what I do is I give everyone the data set as a homework assignment and say, predict this. Use Excel, use regression, use you know, your favorite data science algorithm to do this. But I do a very cruel thing. I give everyone a different data set, a data set that's been changed slightly. All of your information, Rahul's information, Fariba's information, Amy's information, is all correct. It's just I've changed your scores. I've shuffled your scores around, and I've given you all somebody else's score. So if I've taken the y variable, the dependent variable, the, the result, your quiz result, shuffled it around, and then reattached it. And I've done it differently for everyone, so that everyone has a slightly different shuffle, except I'm smart because I've done this before, and I made sure that Rahul had Rahul's score, and Amy had Amy's score, you know, so that when you look at the data, it makes sense to you as long as you don't compare it with anybody else, right? And I tell you, you only have 30 minutes to work on this because I don't want you killing yourself and then really getting mad at me. So it's a time-limited thing. Just do first impression, get your results, and you all come back, and everybody has different results, right? One person maybe got the real data set, and they get a certain result. And everybody else gets a distribution of results. And maybe somebody got lucky, and something lined up, and they get this really good result that could be published. Right? Is that good news? No. Because there's no relationship between the inputs and the outputs in, in the real world that they got. They're, they're, but there appears to be in the data set they got. So what has happened is, by, by, if we had a whole bunch of us here, we now know by counting how many results that were random were better than the real results. So let's say the wise, all-seeing oracle get, is given the real data and gets the real result, and then all the rest of us have fake data. However many of us got a better, more apparently better result than the real result, that is a measure of the significance of the real result. Because the t-test, the chi-squared test, the f-test, all the statistical tests 
are just a way of answering the question, how likely could I have gotten a result this interesting randomly? So what we're doing is we're just finding out. We're creating a world where the null hypothesis or randomness rules by breaking the relationship between the inputs and the outputs and then running some experiments. So I'll, I'll do that in a minute with the baseball data and I think it'll, we'll see it. So how likely could I have gotten, not this result, but how likely could I have gotten a result this interesting, something that scored as well or better than this result, that looked as good or better than this result? How likely? Well, let's count. We did it 100 times, we do it 1,000 times. We'll count how likely it is. That's the true significance. That's what the statistical geniuses Fisher and Pearson, Neyman, and those guys that invented statistics would have done had they had computers. But because they didn't have computers, they had to do some shortcuts with calculus. That sounds really weird, shortcuts with calculus. So they made certain approximating assumptions. Whenever you do either of those things, assume or approximate, you're making a break from accuracy with reality some really complex math to get at something that was workable that people have a really hard time applying today. So why are we still using that when we can do a more accurate, more simple, more understandable method with what the, the tool we have right in front of us? It's incomprehensible to me why things are taught. I guess it's a part of the hazing process, you know? why things are taught the old way when the new way is so much better. And the new way is, would have been the old way if it had been possible back in the day. So look up resampling as a way of doing statistics rather than calculus, and life will be much easier. You know, statistics is the hardest caught method. It's the least well caught method. It's been studied to be the discipline in the university which is least affects a human's brain, <laughs> it is least well caught by the human brain. Well, I, I was actually teaching a bunch of data science stuff to a bunch of statistics professors, and they heard me say taught. And I didn't say taught, I said caught. Still, they weren't really pleased with me. But that's what the studies say. And it's something to do with the teaching. But it's also something to do with statistics. Statistics is hard. It's like a combination of calculus and Buddhism. You know, the reality you see is but one possible reality. Oh, and fill out this integral to get the answer. You know, it's just not, it's not an easy thing to, to figure out. Anyway, this is much easier. This, if, because really statistics arose from dice and cards. Gamblers, rich gamblers paying poor mathematicians to figure out odds for them. That's what it was all about. So if you, so if you think about, you know, rolling, car, rolling cards, rolling dice or picking cards, what are the odds that such and such could have happened? That's what, that's a much better way to think about it. So the, the algorithm I've written out here, I'll, say, I'll share the notes with, with y'all and you can see it in more detail. It's on our website. I even have an animated video on our website with little music and stuff and little cartoon figures dancing on how to do target shuffling and so forth. So if you want to know how to do it, but um, you'll see I have a nice little acronym. You, you, you save your best apparent discoveries, your BADs. That's all your results with the, with the fake data. With the, with the shuffled data, and then you see where it falls on the distribution, and that's your true significance. So um, the first time I used this was back in the mid-95. In mid, in mid so I kind of invented it for that. Now, I say invented it. Uh, looking in the literature, I actually rediscovered it. It was actually, this idea was actually thought of about 100 years ago, or thereabouts, if we're trying to get it about right, maybe 90 years ago. But it was like, well, we can't possibly do this, so let's do calculus instead. You know, so, you know, um, so it's really more of a rediscovery or reinvention. But um, um, and there are it is, the idea has popped up a few other places, um, but it is not well known at all, and it really needs to be um, promulgated. But the first time that I had to invent it for my work was uh, when we were doing hedge fund work. So we had this hedge fund. The thing it was trading was this uh, yellow thing, and we could either go long or flat. And as you know, it's theoretically impossible to predict the market. So 
uh, you shouldn't pay any attention to me right now, but anyway, no, but we, uh, we had found a pocket of inefficiency in the market, and um, uh, we were putting our, putting our money where our mouth was, and I had my entire retirement system riding on this thing, uh, $40,000. Um, the client had finally put money in it and had $2 million riding on it starting here. We lost him $4,000 in day one, so we waited till day two to talk to, talk to him. But anyway, uh, the green is um, the result of trading. So you can see that it, it, it went up for a while, and then it had a very long flat to down period, and then ended up for the year. So it was up 28% for the year. The market itself was very volatile and was down 12% for the year. This is a group of stocks. Um, and so it was up 40% compared to the target. And again, it can't make money on the downside. The best you could do is go into cash and step aside, because you couldn't short this, this set of stocks uh, at the time. So we want to invest. You ready to invest for the next year? It's up 40% delta. We trade once a day at most. Uh, you decide right before close, or 30 minutes before close, roughly speaking, if you're going to be in for the next day or not. So right about now, we'd be calling. Well, right about now on the East Coast, we'd be calling and saying hold or buy or sell for the next day. Well. Even though it did phenomenally well, it was a terrifying ride for the client. He had two million in, and with a 28% return, that's like two, over two and a half million. You know, he made over half a million, and he did not want to put any more money in it. He didn't want to invite other clients in. Well, you know, we really needed that to happen in order to make it be income generating. And so I used t-tests and stuff to, to convince him of the significance of this result. And he was unconvinced, even though he had a Harvard MBA and a Texas A&M engineering degree. He was a smart guy. Um, so I did this resampling target shuffling thing. In this period of a year, there are 250 trading days. And about 100 of those days we were in, and 150 of those days we were flat. So think of 100 ones and 150 zeros. And the essential aspect of it took me days to figure out how to test this and figure this out, about three days. <laughs> it seems embarrassing now, but it's always when you're facing a new problem, it's always, it always takes a while. The essential aspect was the timing. So I figured, OK, let's just randomly shuffle the timing of those 100 days that we're in and see how many of those timings are better versus how many are worse. So I did it 1,000 times, and 15 of them were better. So 15 out of 1,000 is 1.5%. So only 1.5% of the time, and you, know, you could, in theory, try all possible combinations of 100 and see what the actual percentage is. This is a sampling from that distribution. But it's a pretty good sample of 1,000. So 1.5% of the time, you could be in the market exactly as often as we were and do better. So that's 98.5% chance that it's real. That it, and that's much higher than my intuition was. My intuition was it would be like 85% or 90% chance, something like that. So 98.5 was a very positive success for me. So and on that result, which was really the same, that's exactly what the t-test was telling us, because the, the assumptions of the t-test actually fit this situation if you use log returns. But he ignored the t-test because people have learned to ignore t-tests because their approximations are often wrong. But that result made sense to him. So I tried it this often, and this often it did better. Makes sense to a decision maker. And then he put 20 million in. And then we were off to the races, and we had accepted other money. And eventually, uh, there was about a half a billion invested in various models. We had about 100 models going. This was the first one. And, and the hedge fund ran for about 10 years, with the edge starting to really erode in the last three years. And then target shuffling was used to tell us that the edge was disappearing. And we shut down the hedge fund with everyone coming out ahead. So all the investors came out ahead because the same method told us when our edge was disappearing. And we shut it down. So that's not the normal way hedge funds close. So uh, this is a very, very powerful technique for knowing when you've got something and, and when it's real.
versus luck. And it started to be luck near the end, and that's when we shut it down. I mentioned we use it in the gas and oil production. Here's what the lift curve looks like, or the cumulative, the cumulative response curve looks like. So when you, when you build a model for things, uh, it's sort of a needle in a haystack problem. Has anybody here built a lift curve before, or look at the cumulative response curve? It's a very simple, very powerful technique. What you do is you, you model everything, you score everything. So you have some known wells, or known people who've churned, or something like that, and say you're modeling churn or fraud, or in this case, wells clogging up. So you have a one to the bad things and a zero to the good things that are known. And you build a model to predict that. Now you score all these unknown characters. And they might have scores from 0.2 because it's rare. The one is rare, so the scores never go very high. Maybe say 0.2 down to 0.001, you know, something that's very low. So you sort them by the highest score being your top priority, be right over here on the left-hand side. Folks with the highest score, the highest likelihood of being interesting to you, you put them on the, on the left-hand side, and the lowest likelihood you put on the right-hand side. So you, so you sort everybody by their model score, okay? Then you look at the cumulative response of them. Now you can either look at the count of people that are actually defaulting or churning, or you can look at the value of the people that are actually defaulting or churning. So it either increments by one or it increments by a value of what, what that customer is or how much fraud was involved, or in this case, how much what they call production was deferred. They always think they're eventually going to get that gas out. You know, it's just deferred. We'll get it later. Or how much production was lost. So these are millions of cubic feet of of gas that are lost, and, then, and you can see that there are millions of millions of cubic feet that are lost. Now where that blue line is, is what they have staff to, to affect, to act on. So they can go to about 20% of the wells that they have. So they can go about, about one-fifth of the way down the list. So the really important thing is who makes the top fifth of the list. Same thing if you're doing fraud investigation. You might only have enough people that can investigate 10% of all your cases or 3% of all your cases. So who makes the cut and doesn't? We do a lot of anti-fraud work for federal agencies like the IRS and the Postal Service and so forth. And we built, in conjunction with a couple of other companies years ago, anti-fraud models for the IRS for um, earned income tax credits, which is a phenomenal fraudulent uh, channel. If you want to defraud the government, that's one of the best ways to do it. Uh, news you can use. No. Uh, actually, uh, organized crime is actually the, the major fraudster through that route. But we have been credited with saving them already $7 billion through our models. So uh, the power of the return on investment you can get with data science is, is really, really powerful. There's a lot more that needs to be saved, though. So anyway, you can only go a certain depth. Now, if, if you're doing this for a, a mailing or something, you might be able to go any depth, but, but for things like where you have uh, staffing is involved, you only have a certain depth you can go. And so what's really important is you want to maximize how much you can save at that depth in, in the list. So I can go this far in the list, I want to see how far that thing can go. And here, we're saving three times what the random, so randomly, if you picked, you would expect this line to go straight from zero to that peak. If you went all the way in the list, you would save all that gas, and a random line would go straight. In fact, if I go to the next uh, chart, it actually shows not only the random line, but the 95% confidence interval. So 95% of the time, if you picked oil wells, uh, gas wells randomly, they would fall inside those bounds that are shown there. So if you look at that dark red line, it's three times higher than the random line. So this has a lift of three. The model is giving you three times the return at that blue intersection point than the normal way of doing things of kind of randomly. Uh, random, this is not necessarily the normal way of doing things, but that's the default comparison if you don't have a schedule or something like that. Now, this chart did not convince the folks in Houston very uh, much for some reason. In fact, when we predict a well is going to clog up, we're only right 57% of the time. 
So somebody in Houston said, why, using elder research is like flipping a coin. But they were only right 17% of the before. So I, if I'd been in that meeting, when that famous quote came out and stuck in everyone's head, I'd have said, well, doing it the way you are is like rolling the dice, you know. Because uh, flipping a coin would be a lot better than having to get a six on a dice, for getting the heads on a coin is three times better. So that, I wasn't there to help change the image. <laughs> you have to fight fire with fire. Uh, but, so somehow that wrong thing, oh, you're only right 57% of the time. Well, that's the, that, that gives people the wrong impression. Well, what are you doing now? You're only right 17% of the time. So we're three times better. The, the right thing is, what is the ratio of how you're doing now? Three times better. Or put that in dollar terms. But this chart actually made sense to them because they knew that there's some chance that you could do better than, than random. But when it's so far above the 95% confidence interval, engineers at least know about confidence intervals. They know there's randomness and so forth. But when you show them that the confidence intervals are way below where the result was, somehow that broke through to them. So it's always interesting to see when does a decision maker get it? Because they don't always get it with what I, what makes sense to me, or what makes sense to the last decision maker in a different industry, in a different background. So you have to try, try things different ways sometimes to make sense to them. But somehow what they called the banana chart, <laughs> the one with the confidence intervals around it, made sense to them in ways that, simpler ways that didn't. Um, but this, this could save them hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, by just using the same resources they have and giving them a schedule six months in advance. This, and by the way, you could save a lot more if you could reduce that schedule to three months in advance or two months in advance because the predictions are much more accurate with less lead time. But for some reason they had, and that's another thing, why a six month advance lead time to provide the crews their schedule of where to go? You shouldn't need that much time. So there's, there's some arguing that needs to be done to change the business problem because it has a big effect on the technical problem. Um, all right, so, but if you look at it with uh, target shuffling, it's even more impressive. If you, if you look at you know, assigning random wells and doing it with that target shuffling case, only four out of 10,000 random assignments are better than the one that the model came up with. So, you know, there's extremely significant result. or studies that they've done, uh, and each one of them comes with, you know, with, with p-values. And so for those people who are trying to identify p-hacking, what they'll look at is the, the distribution of p-values, right? And so one would expect if it's a real result that you get more, you know, 1% p-values than 5% p-values. And if you get a whole bunch of, you know, 0.049s and not a lot of 0.01s, <laughs> then that's suggestive that Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So there's another word for it is p-hacking. Uh, it sounds like strange, but, but the p-value is, um, is the probability value or the related to probability that I've been talking about. The threshold for a medical study is this 0.05 or 5% chance. I mean, think about it. What, why should there be a only 1 in 20 chance that something could be random? Wouldn't you, if you had a rare disease, wouldn't you want a drug that had a two out of three chance of being real, you know? Wouldn't you want to use it or something like that? I mean, why is it so low? And the sad thing is it's not low enough to, to cut, you know, the lower they make the, the, um, the significance that it has to be, that the chance that it could be random, the higher the bar they're raising, the, the, the harder they're making it to publish, the lower the chance that spurious results should be getting in there. But as low as they've got it now, half to 95% of the results are spurious. So it's just, it's just completely broken. It's completely uncalibrated. But the, the good news is this is a way to recalibrate it. But the problem is from a, from a politics and society problem is anyone who does it right now is going to find it impossible to publish under the current <laughs> regulations. So until the rules are changed to say 
you have to use a new way that's calibrated correctly, um, it's going to be very hard. Yeah. Five percent. For how many iterations you need to run this, and uh, so there's not a good rule of thumb, but the point is it should converge as you do more iterations. So it's not hard to do more iterations usually, because typically you would do it where there's no human in the loop. So it's just a matter of a little more computer time. I'll, I'll show an example in a little bit where we'll see it sort of converge. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll zip along here. So we'll look now at a problem where our data is divided into cubes. You know, we've got geographic age and income, let's say, and, so, and we look and say, for what subpopulation, we had this first for a medical problem where I first ran into this, the company was looking for what subpopulation does this treatment work better than this treatment? And they were slicing and dicing their population of data of people and really rejoicing if they found a subset that, that the treatment worked really well for. And I realized there's something wrong with this, and I realized it was related to this, this kind of is kind of a p hacking or a hot spot hacking, just like the timing hacking that can occur with looking for hedge funds. You're torturing the data until it confesses, basically. Yes, yeah, that sounds that sounds right. Wow, that's scary. Um, yeah, there's this famous uh, contest that was for uh, breast cancer. That was a contest in a data science contest that I think 50 or so data science teams competed in, and one team won. And the and a person on the winning team uh, who is um, let's see, she's out here in California, um, Claudia Perlick. Um, Anyway, her team won, but then she also looked at the data and realized that there was a higher concentration early in the database of, of breast cancer than there was later in the database, and then noticed that the ID number of the cases was a great predictor of, of breast cancer or not. And then notice that the ID number, and that's not a good thing. By the way, I always throw ID number in and case number in as a possible predictor to see if that's the case because it, A, it shouldn't be, and B, it might, there might be information in the ordering of the data for some reason exactly like this. And it turned out that the labs use different ranges of IDs. And some people were sent to screening. Some people were at screening labs, and some people were sent to more serious labs, where there was a much higher prevalence of the cancer, and they had lower ID numbers assigned to that lab. But the models that didn't use ID number were basically picking up on the darkness level of the of the image. That's all they were picking up on was the average darkness level of the image, because the average darkness at the serious labs was darker than at the screening labs, and therefore there was more cancer. And so the model was saying, "Die is not the darker the image, the more cancer." Stupid human, you know, and getting great results, and that was better than anything else. And I've got dozens of examples, well, a handful of examples like that that are as you know, tanks are not tanks in trees or not, and the result turned out to be entirely based on whether it was a rainy day or not because of the data of when tanks were taken on a rainy day and the data without tanks were taken on a sunny day. So no matter how much data you held out or which cases you held out, it did really well on the out-of-sample data because of bad experimental design where there was a hidden factor that really was obvious to a neural net. And so, you know, you have to bring in information from outside of the data. You show a model the data, and that's all it knows about the world. It has no common sense. And so if there is some trivial thing, like the darkness of the image, it'll pick up on it and say, I'm going to go with that. And you no know, human would do that, but it does no common sense. So no matter what technique you learn, you cannot protect 
the computer from doing. That's one of the problems and the mistakes a computer has. A computer will go for whatever the easiest answer is, and you have to protect it from design problems like that. Um, well, let's look at this last example, which is baseball. So uh, here's a strike zone, uh, horizontal and vertical, and then the, the depth is the pitch velocity. So it's sort of like the depth at a certain time that the ball would appear. The, um, this is all from June 1st, 2013, the Major League ball actual pitches on that day. I haven't recorded which ones were curve balls and which ones were knuckle balls and so forth, but they, that'll be reflected in where they are in the box and their speed and so forth. The red ones were hits. Now hits not only were connected with, but they weren't fielded, they weren't caught. The person got on base safely, somebody else didn't get forced out. It's a very complex thing, but they were hits. And only 15, and only 9%, 9.4% of all the pitches thrown in the strike zone on that day were hit. So hits are very hard to do. Um, and in this little sample here, the first of 40-ish or so samples that we'll look at, 15% of them were hits, and the p-value is 0.4. Now, the way the p-value works is a 0.5 means it's totally normal compared to the larger sample. So the larger sample is considered to be the reality that you'll get 9.4% hits. In the smaller sample, um, what you would like to see is something very different from the, the reality with a lot of samples to back it up. So if it's very different but only has a few samples, the p-value won't be very significant because there's only a few samples. So the p-value does a really nice job of adjusting for the fact that there's only a little bit of evidence, and so it could have happened. If you, if you had only one hit and no misses, well, that's unusual, but it could have happened, and, it, and the p-value will not be so extraordinary. But if you had a lot of hits and no misses, that would be truly extraordinary given that only 9% of the time is hit. So the p-value does a great job of showing the weirdness of the subset with respect to the larger set. That's its, that's its job, is to account for the difference in the ratio and the sample size. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this uh, p-searching or p-hacking. We're gonna look through all of these and we're just gonna do a subset of them. We run across one that's really interesting here the p-value is very low to show the interestingness. It has 37 dots in it, nine of which are hits. That's a 24% hit rate. So that's very different from the population with a lot of samples, and that's why its p-value is significant. So we could easily publish this one. So we hang on to that one, and we go looking around, and we look at all of them, and none of them are better. So that's the best one. So we say, that's the hot spot, and we start to be thinking about it. Those of us who are right-handed, low and outside, and relatively slow pitch, you're thinking, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for hits, and you know, I've got, I've got an article I'm thinking about right now, and I can, I can write it up, and I'll use examples from history, and you know, off to the races we go, and with that low a p-value, we're definitely gonna get it published and everything. But is that the p-value of that result? Is that the significance? Yes, that's the, that's the p-value of a box of that size drawn from that. But is that the p-value of our search? Is that the p-value of our search? So we do target shuffling to say, what would happen if we took the same data and we just shuffled the target? So the target here is hitness or redness. So if you look, all the dots stay the same. Look at a particular dot. It's in the same position. We're not changing the physics of the problem because some of those pitches might be impossible. We don't know. We might be causing a man to be pregnant or to, you know, you know I don't know, two-headed twins. I don't know, we're gonna cause some strange thing to happen. No, we're gonna keep all the physics the same. We're just gonna change the label of who's a good customer and who's a bad one, or who's, a, who's churning and who's not. That's all we're gonna do is change the label. In this case, change the redness, all right? Now we research, and now there's a new hotspot, which is totally not important to us where it is, because this is fake data. What's important to us is how strong it is, the lowest p-value. We want to save that strength, right? Then we're going to color, recolor it, research it, save that strength. Because we want to get a distribution of these strengths, and we want to see how often these strengths beat the real one. How often these best apparent discoveries or bads beat the real one. So we're going to keep a histogram going. So our real result is this red line. And I did it on a log scale so that it would show up better. 
Worse results, less interesting results are showing up on the counts over here. More interesting results are showing up here. And we're going to go over and over. 40 trials later, we have four results that are more interesting, so about 10%. Um, 100 trials later, 350 trials later, 1,000 trials later, we'll stop there. 1,000 trials later, we have found that 18.4% of the time, our fake results were more interesting. So just to round out, we found that a fifth of the time, the target shuffled data led to a more apparently more interesting result. So what that tells me is that our original result has a, a four out of five chance of being real. It's, that's its level of significance. That random results are more interesting a fifth of the time. So it's a weird way of thinking, statistics is, because you're never certain of anything. But remember, your significance is, what's the likelihood I could have gotten a result where the underlying reality is random that was more interesting? And so we just did that. We created an underlying reality that was more random without changing the physics of baseball. Tested how often that happened. It happened about a fifth of the time. So as a business, if somebody was in baseball business and you had a result that looked like it had a four out of five chance of being real, was that interesting to you? Would that be actionable to you? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. If you were on offense or defense, that would probably be a pretty interesting result. And now you'd be really interested what happens if it's left-handed batter or, you know, you'd want to dig into it. And, and so see if it held up out of sample on new data and so forth. Yeah, all, it's very simple. You, you just, in this case, you just take the, the column variable, which is whether it was a hit or not, and um, shuffle it randomly. So you break it out, you randomize the order of things, and then you reattach it. And then you run your regular modeling algorithm on that and find your best result. So it doesn't take anything too fancy. But, but doing it efficiently, we've actually written some R code for that, and we have an R package for that. If, if, and we have, it's in, it's also, we've mentioned this at a few conferences, and some of the vec vendors have picked up on it and put it in their packages. Uh, NIME is one that has uh, made a module for it and so forth. Yes? So I guess the dynamics are a bit similar as you would use bootstrapping for the mean? Yes, it's very much like a, it's a resampling technique like bootstrapping or cross-validation. It's in that family of what's so-called resampling techniques, which I'm a big fan of. And it's sort of essentially just basically simulating the p-value instead of using an assumption for the distribution? Right, using no assumptions for distribution, you're really testing what is the distribution. Um, but is it similar to the p-value or, or is it different? Well, let's look at the difference here. So. The naive way of doing it would say that your original result had that p-value of one-third of a percent. And this way says you, your, your more accurate p-value is 18.4%. Um, is so it's 50 times worse. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge difference between the naive number and the more realistic number. A huge difference. And so this is believable. And the other first number, you don't know how unbelievable it is. You, don't, you know it's wrong. You don't know if it's an order of magnitude, or in this case, closer to two orders of magnitude wrong. You know, or, or, or you just don't know. And so people just, they freeze, and they, they can't make a decision. The unknowingness is so great. This is, gives them a number that they can say, OK, four out of five. I could work with that. That's right, four out of five times. Looks real to me. It's amazing when you take away that uncertainty, what that does for action. So um, I have a little simulation that runs this. Um, so we love stories. Uh, interpretive, some people, sometimes people say, I want to be able to interpret my model, and I'll protect it that way. That is no protection. You need, you need mathematical science ways to protect it. Uh, science requires replication and transparency. 
most health discovery papers are false. I'm, I'm on the side of believing 90 to 95% of them are false due to this multiple comparison, vast search effect. Whereas resampling, cross-validation, target shuffling grades them fairly. Um, so we need to add it to our arsenal. I have it in, if you go to our website and look it up, we have a, a little, if you want an amusing refresher sometime later, there's a two minute animated uh, video on how to do target shuffling that uh, might be fun to show folks. And uh, I'd, I'd love to correspond with you if you have any questions about it. And if you just can't get enough of instruction and are free on Thursday, I'm teaching a workshop all day long on data science techniques. I don't know if their course is done by then. Or... Okay, so if you just can't get enough and want a whole other day of it, I'm, I'm over in, uh, it's in the Marriott Marquis. Uh, and discount. Yeah. Yeah. So email me, Elder at Elder Research, and thanks so much for having me. It's been great to, great to be here.